Nobody likes a honker. You know, the kind of guy that sits in traffic and just beeps at you the whole time. Yeah, like I said, nobody likes a honker. That is, unless you are a waterfowler like me, and then you love a honker. The kind that flies. Now this kind of honker is what I live for. It makes my heart go pitter-patter and my blood pressure go down. That is, unless you miss. Don't worry, I still love honkers. And how many was that? Probably 50? And everyone. Three shots, zilch. Myself included. Well, Nick, how you doing back there? Small town America, one horse towns, no fancy coffee shops, no expensive restaurants, just maybe one traffic light and a diner that serves home cooked meals. There's usually a hardware store, a pharmacy, a gas station, a few churches, and more bars than churches. In places like this, everybody knows your name. And it's in this kind of town that I grew up. And when it comes to my hunting adventures, it's the kind of place that I've made some of my favorite memories. They call them flyover states, the kind of places in the middle of our country that if you were driving through, you'd stop for some gas and maybe some food, and then you'd just keep on going. But I think that's a mistake because there are so many places like this that if you scratch the surface just a little bit, you'd be surprised what you find. And there might be a lot of ducks and geese here, but there is so much more. This is Central Kansas. Welcome. I've made my way to just outside of Council Grove, Kansas, which lies smack dab right in the middle of two famous waterfall flyways. And it's here that Waylon and I are going to hunt with Kevin Cook of Diamond Creek Outfitters, my good friends Ryan Hatcher and Chris Crow, and world famous call maker Rick Haney. If you've ever heard a goose fly overhead, then you know that they're pretty vocal. And that makes goose hunting a pretty noisy affair. But these dudes that I'm about to hunt with are the exact opposite. This is the calm before the storm. The sleepy, coffee-induced round table of misfits that I have assembled here. It's quite impressive. I've got a airplane guy, an astrophysicist, and who are you? Who, who you, yeah. And a call maker. This is the most important guy. Because this is the dude that'll bring in all the geese and ducks. Or he'll be the guy that we lamb based over <laughs> breakfast later. Yeah. <laughs> Let's go. Let's do it. I'll admit that I've never been much of a morning person. My musician butt likes to stay up late and sleep in. But every hunter knows that the early bird gets the worm, and when it comes to goose hunting, you have to get up extra early because there's a lot of work to do. There are a lot of DOA decoys to set up, and that's okay because I'll be honest, this is one of my favorite parts of waterfowl hunting. As you set up the decoys, there's an excitement in the air for sure, but with that said, I'm pretty sure that nobody is excited as Waylon. As the sun came up over our spread on the first morning, it was clear that I had come to the right place. The geese were everywhere. The calling began, but the geese just kept on going. The ultimate goal in waterfowl hunting is to be on the imaginary X where the birds want to land. But no matter how good of a hunter you are, that sometimes is easier said than done. And as the day went on, we threw the kitchen sink at them, but absolutely nothing worked. And the only thing I worked up was a thirst. Well, we hunted hard today but we couldn't get anything to work. Come to Kansas, they said. It'll be awesome, you'll see. Tons of birds. <laughs> uh, tomorrow's another day. Now for a beer. I'm in central Kansas hunting geese with outfitter Kevin Cook. And in between hunts, Kevin takes me to a spot that illustrates that there is a lot more to this area than just world-class waterfowl hunting. This area is home to part of the legendary Santa Fe Trail. And I'm pretty sure that if these prairies could talk, they'd have a hell of a lot of stories to tell. From dangerous men on the run, families looking for a new life, or people simply seeking adventure. Kansas Prairie, right? I mean, this is quintessential Kansas right here, Flint Hills. 
but there's a spot right here. Doesn't look like much, but apparently this is the Santa Fe Trail, right? That's what the sign says. <laughs> That's what the sign says. It's hard to believe how much history is in this spot coming through here. We're talking about Comanche Indians and wagon trains and people scrapping it out. There's a lot of history here. You drive by here every day. Do you think about it like that? No, not, e not at all. But when you stop to think about it, I mean, it's just amazing that how stuff actually came through here and how they found their way anywhere. Right. I mean, with before all the fences and roads were here, just I mean, how do, you, how do you find your way through that? Yeah, just nothing. There's no landmarks, if anything. Crazy. Pioneered in part by Missouri trader William Becknell, the Santa Fe Trail stretched from Missouri to Santa Fe, New Mexico. Originally, it was part of a trade route between Mexico and America, at least until the Mexican-American War in 1846, when the trail was used to invade Mexico. Later, the trail was used by just about everyone, from stagecoach drivers to men seeking fortune during the gold rush. It was dirty business and full of danger, from harsh weather to brutal attacks from the many Native Americans that lived in the area. But as time went on and after the Civil War, the expansion of the railroad into Kansas took place, and by 1880, a railroad reached as far as Santa Fe, allowing the Santa Fe Trail to fade back into the prairie and into history. All the history here, you almost take it for granted. Yeah. A little bit. <laughs> and you didn't grow up here though, right? No, I grew up in North Central Iowa. So how'd you end up here? Well, I was in the Army and uh, I was stationed up at Fort Riley, just up the road here a little ways, yeah. uh, about 45 minutes to an hour or so. Just like most war veterans, Kevin is a humble guy who doesn't really like to talk about his war experience. And while he'll tell you that he's just a farmer and a waterfowl outfitter, the fact that he served our country in Afghanistan and Iraq makes him an American hero, if you ask me. It was during his time at Fort Bragg in Kansas that he learned just how awesome the waterfowl hunting of this area is. The land here is a perfect storm when it comes to supporting waterfowl. Plenty of food, plenty of ponds and lakes and water, and good old-fashioned peace and quiet. And it was imagining being back in that peace and quiet that helped Kevin get through his two deployments. How much do you feel like your family and hunting and your your lifestyle here helped you get through all that i don't think there's really a a way that it wouldn't have i mean right. sometimes you don't have anything going on and that's all you have is memories and stuff to look back on and look forward to right and without you know family and hunting and stuff like that i mean what what would there have been to come home to literally gives you something to fight for yeah it's crazy well thank you for your service Take a good long look at the faces in this picture. It's because of men and women like this, people like Kevin and the ones who never made it back, that I'm free to travel the world and hunt in places like this. So if you would tonight say a prayer for all of those men and women, both home and abroad, and take a moment of gratitude for the freedoms that they protect that most of us take for granted every day. We're back in the blind for morning number two, and I'm hoping for two things. Number one, I'm hoping that we've successfully predicted where the X is. And number two, I'm hoping that I hit what I'm aiming at. Oh, this bird's right there, right there. But before I can think too much about all that, wish number one is granted. There's a bunch of birds right there. Pick your bird. Get ready. Kill him! If you've ever played sports, then you know that coming off of a losing streak and having a win is a really, really good feeling. Here, good boy. <laughs> That's what it's all about right there. You get, what, five birds? That's one for everybody? I mean, I think I shot two, but whatever. Suddenly, everybody's in a good mood. Best part of waking up. Folgers in your cup. <laughs> One of my favorite parts about waterfowling is the social aspect. Sitting in the blind, drinking coffee, and talking with your buddies. But the truth is that this morning, the geese were working so good, we didn't have time for hardly any of that. All right, get ready. Right there. 
Get ready. Kill him. This hunt is proof that some days are better than others. And this day is better than most. But that's not to say that we didn't have our share of mishaps. I got up late uh, from like a one to a 10 or what What terrible rating scale are we going to uh, That was like a 15, maybe a 19 and a half. <laughs> On the suck scale? I mean, I just don't know. That was supposed to be the last volley. We needed two birds. Two birds, that's it. And we've been shooting well all day. And how many was that? Probably 50. And everyone, three shots, zilch. Myself included. No, that was really not good. As I've found over the last few days, Kansas is such a special place for waterfowl hunting. But it's also home to some interesting characters too. I've been hanging out on this trip with Rick Haney. He's one of the best call makers in the whole country. And in between hunts, he takes me to his shop and inside the world of a world-class waterfowl artist. When I say the words duck call maker or call maker, I don't know many people that make calls. There can't be that many of you guys out there, are there? I mean, there's more now, I think, than there ever has been just because there's so much more information about it. Sure. You know, I mean, you can get on YouTube, you can probably learn how to make a duck call. Right. Now, when I started making calls, that wasn't available. How in the heck did you get into it? I had been buying duck calls. I bought a custom duck call, you know, I was young in, in my marriage to my new wife. and. Yeah. I bought a $125 duck call. And then when I told her that one wasn't good enough anymore and I needed another one, she wasn't very happy with me. Right. <laughs> so I decided, you know, I was like, I, I have a certain set of skills, you know, I'm a machinist and tool maker by trade. Right. So uh, I just started taking some of those skills and applying them to something that I already loved you know, over a period of time and, you know, lots of trial and error. You know, we finally came up with something that, you know, that I liked. Buddy started wanting me to make some calls and, and then their buddy started wanting some calls and it just kind of grew from there, man. So it all started trying not to piss your wife off and now you probably sit down here and blow duck calls all the time and piss your wife off. Pretty much, yeah. 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 Your poor wife. She's a saint. She is a saint. Before calls existed, hunters would use their mouths or decoys or actually ducks themselves to attract their duck pals. And it wasn't until the 1870s that we see the first patent awarded for a duck call. The first patent awarded for a goose call came 15 years later in 1885. Fast forward to the present and waterfowl calls have come a long way. The market is saturated with all sorts of styles and companies that make them, but there are still a handful of artists that make calls the old fashioned way, just like a luthier does with an instrument, just like Rick Haney has been doing for 20 plus years. Wow, that's unbelievable. Look at that. It's hard to believe that was a square block of wood 10 minutes ago. I'm blown away. It's so cool. Now it just makes me want to try it though. I think we should. Basically because you want to make an ass out of me, right? No, I just want to see you do it. He wants to, he wants to make an ass out of me. Well, whether or not I can actually turn, I do know that I can successfully drill a hole. I got that going for me. I think it's all downhill from here. I'm in Kansas learning how to make a duck call from master call maker, Rick Haney. And so far, things are going pretty good. And I figure I'm pretty good with my hands. I mean, how hard can this be, right? Nice. 
Stop. What happened? I don't know. It split. Hmm. Told you I'd screw it up. Man. And I was doing so good. Dude, you were doing really good. Uh, <laughs> and this is where the heartbreak of this thing comes in, I'm sure, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, that's not bad. That's not bad for your first time, bud. Huh? But then, eventually, like always, I screw it up. Rick's passion for waterfowl hunting started at an early age, and that led to learning to call, which led to learning to make calls, which led to him not only becoming one of the best call makers in the world, but also a world-class competition caller. I wanted to be the best duck caller in the world. You've been building calls now for how long? 22 years. Do you still have your first call? I do. This is not the first call I made, but this is the first call I didn't throw away. <laughs> that makes sense. These little things, they're literally little instruments, aren't they? They are. I think about my first fiddle. It's measured in before the fiddle and after right. the fiddle. Yeah. For you, in a lot of ways, it's your life's measured before this first good duck call and after, right? I, think I mean, so. it literally changed your life. Yeah. I've never really thought about it like that, but you're right. Life-changing. Find that in the strangest things, yeah. don't we? It's very cool. One of the great things about the small towns of the world is that they are full of people like Rick Haney. Fascinating people with fascinating skills who, if you just ask, they'll often gladly give you a glimpse into their world. And while I might not get to hunt with the call that I tried to make with Rick, I do get to spend one more day in the blind with him in Kansas. Here, 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 heel, heel, heel. Hold it, heel. Good boy, good boy. <laughs> he listens sometimes. It's so funny, I've been doing this my whole life and every time I do it, every time I get in the blind, I think I love it a little more. There's something about a shivering dog and a hot cup of coffee and good people that make this so special. Yeah, the killing is fun, but that stuff is what it's all about for me. And it's like I'm always reminded just how much I love this every time I do it. It's just, it's so special. Moments. For me, life is all about recognizing the good ones, especially the life-changing moments. When they happen, you need to pay attention and store them in your memory bank. Because if you're aware of them, these are the moments that will make all the bad stuff go away, even if it's just for a moment. And like I said, sometimes those moments are life-changing. Like the moment when Rick Haney, a machinist by trade, made his first duck call. And from there, worked on his craft until he became one of the best call makers in the world. Well done, sir. Good job or a guy like Kevin Cook, who joined the military, which brought him to Kansas. And after he went to fight for his country, he decided to come back and settle in that place and started a business doing what he loves. I've experienced some pretty incredible life-changing moments over the last few years, and that includes not only the things I've done, but the people that I've met, like a call maker and a soldier from the middle of nowhere in Kansas. It's nine o'clock right now. I'm bad this is our, yeah, this is our second limit before nine o'clock in two days in a row. Is this what it's like all the time? No, but it's what we like to do. <laughs> exactly. I like this a lot. Thank you, Kansas.